Hello, everybody. Welcome to Michael's Record Collection, where we talk about great music with the people who make it and the people who love it. I'm joined today by member of Is, John Galgano. John, thanks for your time. Hey, Michael. How you doing? Thank you. I'm very excited to talk to you. I was supposed to talk to you back when Laura Mead's album came out last year. Uh, or was it early this year? I've lost track of time. But, but last uh, year, but I know it's strange, yeah. Yeah, so she said uh, you were going to join uh, when you got home, but then you never got home before we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> so belatedly, we do have you here, but we're going to talk about this album, I Move. This is the original. Yes. This is the one that just came out, 20th anniversary remastered edition with a bonus disc and i can't wait to talk to you about this but first i'm gonna hit you with that question i always ask which is what was your first favorite record john oh wow that's a great question well um i'll answer it this way because i i don't know that i can i i remember exactly but one of the first albums i remember getting as i probably i, I was i don't know six years old or something christmas morning open up you know the it used to be you'd get a record or two for christmas and like they'd be wrapped and you'd be all excited and the record was foreigner four okay so that album and i love that album because that album had urgent on it which i which i loved i would play that song over and over and over again right. i had no idea what it meant <laughs> <laughs> when i was six years old yeah <laughs> i listen to it now and i'm like what? oh my god this song is racy <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah yeah he had but, an uh, urgent i'll go with foreigner four that's fantastic i love the the junior walker sax solo obviously oh, yeah. got one of my favorite foreigner deep cuts on it uh, girl on the moon yeah love that song so uh, that's a good one um now obviously you and your brother are both in is uh you and tom are you from a musical family? Did that get passed down to you, or did you guys uh, start to start the ball rolling? How did that happen? We are from a musical family, um, not necessarily professionally, but um, my our mother uh, was and is quite musical. Um, she was always kind of writing lyrics. Um, huge, huge Beatles fan. Huge Yes fan. Huge Emerson, Lincoln Palmer fan. Mm -hmm. Um, there was always a piano in our house. My mo my mom always made sure there was a, an actual piano, even though we lived in a very small um, condominium complex. There was an upright piano in the house, and um, her brother, our uncle John, also named John, uh, is a is an excellent guitar player and um, he also a, just a lover of progressive rock and. Um, all interesting music so we did grow up with all of that surrounding um but i i guess tom and i were the first to kind of go at it professionally yeah so did you guys start taking lessons at the same time did you even take lessons did you just pick up an instrument and start playing how did that work we did take lessons um i we st tom is five years older than me so he he started before me of course but i started taking piano lessons when i was five years old and i hated every second of it um i t i never wanted to go to the lessons i took took a piano lesson from about five to ten and then at, when i was ten my my mother uh kind of allowed me to decide if i wanted to continue and i said no but but i am eternally grateful that she kind of quote made me take lessons for those years because uh i think the piano is a really great first instrument to be taught on and for me it, it was it has been the basis of everything I've learned on any instrument. Now, I know you play, obviously, piano. You play some guitar. You play bass. Uh, do you play other instruments, or is it just those three, basically? Um, I mean, I could I could approximate a drummer. Um, <laughs> I played some drums on Laura's first album, actually. Um, and uh, but the, and I, I played saxophone when I was in school a little bit. I could probably make some sounds out of a sax now, but I, I, I generally now consider myself a bass player. Uh, although I really love the piano and continue to try to improve on on the piano. Yeah. Now I know you just did a solo show out in California. I'm sure you didn't just stand there with your bass. You had to have some uh, some other accompaniment there. Yes, I I, I played piano and uh, and guitar, and the, the location, which is a great little place in Ho North Hollywood called Kulak's Woodshed, 
and it's really made for it's very intimate you know only probably only holds 25 or 30 people mm -hmm. uh, but they have a piano which is why i wanted to play there because i wanted to uh you utilize the piano so i did about i'd say about 70 percent of that show on piano and about 30 percent on acoustic guitar okay the, and now you had um was that where you were when you posted the video for summer highland falls yes that's exactly where that was so right after the show the 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 venue sent me a an mp4 of the whole show wow with like multiple camera angles and i was like this is amazing <laughs> so i was just like chop i was like oh what should i post first okay i'll post summer island falls and then i posted uh 23 minutes of tragedy and I'll, I'll probably post something tomorrow yeah john galgano the dvd coming your way soon <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure how many people will want that but <laughs> well uh yeah it was uh, i liked your your rendition of that I, I told you online that's my favorite Billy Joel song of, of all time. It's a fantastic song. So thank you. It's nice to see you pulling that one out because that's yeah. not one that gets a lot of covers. It's usually the the big hits. Yeah, look, I will give Laura the, all the credit for that. I've always been a Billy Joel fan, and I was kind of aware of that song. But but years ago, Laura said this. You know, this is my favorite Billy Joel song. Yeah, and and ever since she said that, I'm like, oh, this is an amazing piece of writing. Yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite opening lyrics of all time. That they say that these are not the best oh. times, but they're the only times I've ever known. Just amazing. It's amazing, and it's so freaking true. It's so true. I mean, every every generation, right? It's like, oh, the good old days, the good old days, the good old days. Well, stop saying that because I'm living now. Yeah, and this, these are my times, you know. Yes, this is yeah. why our parents uh, don't get our music. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but fellow New Yorker uh, Billy Joel, obviously, and in honor of this, I, I wore. I just went to New York for my daughter's wedding. And oh, I wore, congratulations! I wore this shirt got the guitar, but it's also got the Empire State Building and the Statue of Liberty and Chrysler Building and some other buildings. So love it, love it, nice. So, um, tell me about the formation of Is. How did that start? How did it happen? What was the germ of that? Yeah. So the germ of Is was uh, Tom and I. You know, when Tom was. 15 16 17 and i was 10 11 12 uh tom was really really getting into music in a um serious serious way just always playing guitar piano um he was writing his own music and i was kind of watching as the little brother um and he would involve me and so you know we kind of always had this idea in the back of our head like oh we'll form a band someday we'll form a band and we we would always think of try to think of like what would our band be called what name what what should our band be named even before we knew what we were doing um and we did have this concept of of a name is um there was a pitcher for the new york mets at the time jason isringhausen whose name nickname was izzy mm -hmm. and uh we thought about izzy for a name but then um we thought it sounded too much like iggy or iggy pop or something and so we just took the y off i'm like is that's a great that's you know it's three letters like yes so we can write it really big and and people can see read it um and it didn't sound like anything that anybody else was doing and then when tom went to college uh he met greg our drum one of our drummers mm -hmm. they bonded over a shared love of yes and genesis and then through greg tom met brian and paul aka brems mm -hmm. um and uh we all played on one of tom's in one of tom's concerts at his uh at college for there was a composer's concert and i guess that would probably be in the first performance of an is iteration in 1994 1995 Gotcha. So yeah. you uh, did, was Tom the one that got into progressive music first? Well, as I said, like, our, our, our mother was really, um, and is lo loves that music. So we always had like Emerson Lake and Palmer records around the house. So we kind of grew up with it. In fact, it's one of the, I, I don't know if you feel this way, Michael, but for the Beatles, like, I don't remember a time when I discovered the Beatles. I just always knew them. Yes. Does that sound right? That feel right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of feel that way about Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Like, I don't remember discovering them. I just remember them being a part of my life. Mm -hmm. Whereas a band like King Crimson, for example, I definitely discovered them at some point in my life because it wasn't part of our, you know, youth. Yeah. Um, so, Tom, yeah, I mean, Tom was into it and I was into it kind of right alongside him as the younger brother. Got it. Yeah, I think what, for me it was um, 
when I was really young, we listened to the radio a lot. Uh, my parents mm -hmm. weren't big into the Beatles in terms of buying their music, but they were on the radio because they were still getting played on the radio in the early 70s, obviously. Oh, sure. But also you were getting Paul McCartney and John Lennon songs, uh, solo songs getting played on the radio. So I kind of discovered all of that at the same time. Right. Wow, that must have been an exciting time. I can remember because we – I'm originally from New Jersey, and we moved to Ohio when I was in kindergarten. And we would come home to New Jersey, and we would come home and, and visit – grandparents and relatives and and i can remember listening to listen to what the man said by paul mccartney yeah. on the radio on this these the long drive through pennsylvania going down the pennsylvania turnpike and and yeah. and that was one of the ones that was like one of my first radio discoveries was that one. Oh, it's such a good song too yeah, yeah. that one st that one stuck out for me and i also remember um, another one that was popular right i guess right around that time would have been uh Frankie Valley's swearing to God. <laughs> I don't know if I know that song. <laughs> yeah, it was. I don't know what it was, but it was uh, those two songs got a lot of airplay, at least in the Midwest. And right, right. We would always hear them on the radio on the on the trip. Yeah. So let's. You mentioned these guys, so I already I'll talk about is is uh, Tom Galgano, your brother on keyboards and vocals, yourself John Galgano, bass guitar, uh, vocals, keyboards, Paul Bremner on guitars. Greg DiMaselli, acoustic drums and percussion. Very interesting thing about is is you have two drummers, and Brian Karelian, your other drummer, does uh, some electronic percussion in addition to some acoustic drums, and uh, then you're of course your two amazing uh, vocalists, Anne Marie Burns and Laura Mead. Now, when did they come into the picture? Because you told me about the guys. Yeah. So there, um, the start the, is always had two female vocalists in the band. Uh, however, at the beginning and on Sliver of a Sun, our first album, those two female vocalists were Danielle Altieri and Michelle, uh, uh, oh my goodness, Michelle Celestri. Um, and they were friends of Tom's and Greg's from college. Um, there were, there, there came a time around Sliver of a Sun, so 98, 99, when they were doing kind of other things. And we, we were for a moment, a, a five piece of just, the boys mm -hmm. but it was around that time that that i started dating laura and tom started dating Anne marie and um as fate would have it they both have amazing voices um i mean laura and i met because we because a mutual friend who was forming a band in college introduced us so i kind of knew you know she was a singer before i knew her um and so uh it seemed kind of serendipitous and like fate to, to say oh well we have you know would you like to sing with us <laughs> would you like to be in the band and sing and uh that's how that came about and here you guys are all these years later still exactly still doing it so doing it. sliver of a sun came out um in in 98 and then four years later you've got i move tell me what those four years were like for is so the years the years leading up to sliver were we played a lot of shows um we would go into manhattan quite a bit and play these kind of like four band nights where you'd have 45 minutes and you have to set up real quick and break down real quick um and we were all young and ready to do that and eager and so we played a lot of that we also did we also did some kind of like parties and just any gig we can get our hands on at the time mm -hmm. um and recording Sliver, we had, you know, written these songs. Uh, Tom wrote a lot of those songs on Sliver, um, but the band wrote a couple of them. Assurance is a good example of a of a band written song. Um, and then between between those two albums, you know, pers personally, a lot happened. I mean, I I graduated from college. I was still in college when Sliver of a Sun came out, but I had graduated college. I went to law school. I started going to law school. Um, Tom and Anne Marie got married. Um, so personally a lot happened. I think Greg and his wife, Michelle had, um, they had gotten married a little bit before Sliver, but they, they kind of went on this cross country road trip. There was a lot kind of personally going, going on. Um, and I think we as a band were trying to figure out where we were going next and, um, had this concept of where, if we're going to be a band and if we're going to pursue this how are we going to pursue this? Because there were moments where we we're like, should we just write pop songs? 
and try to get a record deal or something. I mean, we didn't, you know, we didn't really know it was <laughs> well, well, we didn't know what this was about. Yeah. Um, or should we try to just do what comes naturally to us? And even after Sliver, I don't think we were aware that there was this whole progressive rock scene, you know. So um the the I move concept is really about us as a band. I mean, to me, this is what it means. It's about us as a band finding kind of defining what we wanted to do and, and making some decisions about how we wanted to write music. And so um, that's what the concept is to me. It might, it, it kind of vaguely follows this character who's kind of looking for, you know, his way. Um, and uh, so that, you know, it, because of all the personal stuff that happened during that time, it's a really important album, I think for all of us. And um, in on many days, I think it's our best album. Yeah, it's it's interesting because most bands will tell you their most recent album is their best album. The best right. thing we've ever done. We're getting right, better right. every every day. Yeah. But it's you do seem to have this awareness that this album was something special. Mm -hmm. Which is great because you've now given this the 20 year anniversary treatment. This is now a nice uh double disc. You've got 70 plus minutes of uh bonus material on there. Yep. So we'll get into this. For me personally, this is also a meaningful album as well because, and, and I don't know if I told, I know I told Brems at the first Cal Prague. I mm -hmm. don't know if I told you this or if this got back to you, but the song Light From Your Eyes mm -hmm. was on a disc that I gave our wedding DJ because, wow. of course, I have I have to be hands-on when it comes to music. And so we, we hired Obviously. a DJ and we told him we don't want a Macarena and we don't want you know some of these other songs that <laughs> right. you would normally play, but play what you want is but not those, but make sure everything on this disc gets played. Mm -hmm. So light from your eyes it was played at my reception and we danced to that and, wow. and and it was very meaningful. And and we're sitting around the uh hotel pool at Cal Prague and somebody had brought a guitar, I think Duke, one of our, our DJs over at the, the dividing line when I was there, and Brems grabbed the guitar and he started playing the intro to that song. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> so it does have a special meaning for me as well. So this album was uh, released originally, like I said, in 2002, the 20th anniversary edition, as we talk, came out today when this yes. is being recorded on the 18th of November. And uh, this is on uh, your label, Dune Records. Yes. And you've been doing this pretty much as a DIY all along you you didn't bother like we're not going to bother shopping around for a record deal we're just going to make our own record deal pretty much pretty much there were moments here and there where it might have happened um on a not on a I don't mean like a Sony music kind of scale but mm -hmm. um on some of the prog labels that you and your listeners might be aware of um where I think there were moments where we could have gone that way um but it's been so freeing to be able to to not have to answer to anybody <laughs> um and we've been really lucky i think and that's why that's part of the reason why i love i move it because i think i move even if we did, hadn't released this anniversary edition i move still sells i mean we still sell cds of i move mm -hmm. um and so for me it's the, it's the album that enabled us financially to to take like to say oh we can keep doing this like let's make some more CD. Let's make some more music, yeah. and so it really was the catapult for everything else. Without I move, there's no my river flows. There's no darkened room. You know all that stuff. Yeah. Do you have any concept of how the word about I move got out? Because it seemed like right after that, you guys were doing a whole bunch of festivals. It's a great question. I I. I'm not sure I remember specifically how the word got out, but I I do remember this, that we got a call from someone at Prague West, which was the precursor to Cal Prague, mm -hmm. and they had heard coming like light, I think. And I I think I think they had left a message on our answering machine at the time. <laughs> and um they said they were considering us to play the festival. And I was kind of like, oh my God, really? Like, you're going to pay for us to come to California and play play your music? Um, and they wanted to hear another song or two. So we sent them, I think, Star Evil, Nova Sue. Um, and, and right after that happened, right after we were booked for Prague West, then we were booked for Prague Day. Um, and then things just started kind of happening. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know um, how the kind of word got out. There were a lot of positive reviews that that came in. I'm sure we sent out a ton of promo copies, as as one does. Yeah. Um, I still have some of the original press kits, so we definitely sent out like you know a folder with I'm with our picture and the CD to all these people. Yeah. Yeah. And there were a lot of, of prog nerd uh, DJs out there playing your music on these uh, online radio stations. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean that's how that's how it happened for us for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, I move is uh, it, it, you guys decided to redo this, and I want you to take me through what all was done because it, here's the thing: is that a lot of people will buy an album. And then a reissue comes out. And you're like, oh, I got to buy the net same album. Or they're, they want, it's a cash grab. They want me to, to right. get this again. And I move is a, is a good sounding album. But when you hear the new one, and I, I don't, I don't say this lightly. It's an incredible transformation. Mm. This is in, and I, I even went in and looked at like the waveform <laughs> to see, it was like, is there a noticeable difference? There is um, an incredible clarity to the new mix. It brings things out that I don't know that I was completely aware of, especially when Brems does these little sort of Steve Hackety guitar bits here and there. It's like, Mm -hmm. wow, I don't even remember if I heard this before. And it's a little louder, but it's not brick walled. Like I said, that's why I went in and looked at the waveform. Everything has more space. And it's got more bite to it with the bass yeah. and the guitar. So how did you get this sound? <laughs> well, you're to- really, I wish Tom was here um, because he is the real audiophile and master engineer. But I can you know, talk through a little bit. Mm-hmm. First of all, I'm really glad that that's your response. I I thought it would be people's response because I, I've been listening to it for almost a year now like this. I mean, we've made a lot of tweaks between then and now, but uh, I knew that it was going to be much much better sounding than the original i've all i've always loved the sound of i move i think it, it's a kind of there's a little bit of a hominess to it that makes that's i think um charming about it mm-hmm. um however you know the songs have a lot of power behind them and i thought that the audio should match the power of the songwriting uh so we first number one our our mastering engineer his name is joe lambert we used him for don't panic um and um laura's album and he's an amazing mastering engineer so we um we actually went back to the dat tapes which i have to shout out to alan benjamin who uh works uh with the prog house and is in, in the band advent because he had a dat machine and so tom was able, we didn't have a dat machine but we had the tape so tom was able to go to alan's place and, and extract everything mm-hmm. and we brought those to joe and then joe has just crazy expensive amazing mastering equipment so he can go in and in the spaces and tweak you know peaks and valleys here and there and bring out things and i i just remember when it first hit me was when i already know the song i already know came on and the when brems takes his solo it just sounded like in in joe's hand it sounded like this lush just beautiful you know where i've always loved that song and i've always loved that solo but now it sounded to me like it was enveloping me in velvet or something. And um, once I heard that, I knew that there was something special. But even after that, Tom um, went into individual tracks and did some things with those. Um, there are some mixing choices that he made to bring up certain uh, keyboards or guitar lines or things like that. So, um, so yeah, a couple, it's gone. Th- it went through a couple of iterations. I was doing a bit of an A B today. I was listening to the old track, then the new track, then the next old track, then the next new track, and and on and on. And it was it was just striking to me how it it just seemed like even even when you listen on surround sound discs, when you get a surround sound version of an album, a well known album, you always find something you're like, ah, oh, I missed the thing that was there. In this one, it just seemed like every choice was the right choice to bring. Mm-hmm. To bring uh, to bump up a little bit it it just seems i guess vibrant is the word i'm looking for it's just got this new vibrancy to it and it really it almost jumps out of the speakers in a way that it didn't before so wow. i when i say 
that it's worth it just for the new uh, for the new remastering alone i'm not just paying lip service i think it's i think it's this is the way that the album should be heard oh thank you michael that's that's awesome and yet there's over an hour of new material <laughs> so you still get a whole lot of good new stuff to go with it as well so yeah um i want to go through this a little bit in terms of uh you know what what you're getting here and, and how this was added. So I'm going to start with, I'm actually going to start with disc two Great. and ask you about some of these, uh, these songs. So it opens with a live version of I move. Where was this one recorded? The I move was recorded at Cal Prague in 2008. Okay. Yep. So I saw this one. You did. <laughs> and uh, so that's good. And then you've got some, an alternate version from here. I can see the horizon. Mm-hmm. Um, was that one just, just laying around in the can uh, that didn't get used? So that song is actually on um, Paul Bremner's solo album called Witness, mm -hmm. uh, which deserves its own kind of reissue and, and not necessarily a remaster, but, but probably it's one of those albums in the Dune Records catalog that I think got a little bit lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. um, but that song is on that album, but this is a remix of that. Okay. And then you've got some acoustic versions. And then these were just re, these were just recorded this year. Correct. Was and this, this a live in the studio thing or? This is all Tom. He had this okay. concept of doing piano versions of these songs. And so, you know, he played, he sent me one of them and I was like, you should just, this is awesome. Like you should just do this. People will love hearing you do this, you know? So that's all Tom, all the piano stuff. Okay. And then you've got, uh, a live confusion jam. That is from Pittsburgh, uh, Three Rivers, Prague, okay. which I think was 08, I think. All right. Yeah. I don't remember. I think I went to one. I went to the second one, I think. I didn't go to the first one. Okay. Uh, and then um, you've got a live in studio spinning around. That's from the dividing line. Okay. So you, you I remember when you did that, you did a... A live in studio broadcast over the dividing line, which uh, R.I.P. the dividing line. Yeah, uh, that was that was one of our big big events when you guys uh, did that. You guys did a pretty lengthy show. We did, yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, which I believe I just saw on your DVD. Oh yes, exactly. So I recently yep. watched uh, recently watched the DVD. That was the one of the bonus uh, bonus yep. features of the DVD. Uh, you've got a near fest early mix of Star Evil Noma Sue, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure what an early mix of that is because you did do the near fest uh, live at near fest uh, CD. Yes, so that's it's just a uh, I, I believe Tom had iterations of that because the near fest obviously was recorded multi track live, mm -hmm. and so Tom did a mix of Star Evil that ended up on the live at near fest, but this was something he found that was. A different different mix of that okay um then you have the unreleased track with the world away which i thought did you put that maybe on your band camp at some point or something it wasn't on band camp um that song was never released by dune records um it might ha it may have been on a on a, a charity cd at some point that's what it was that's yeah. where i've heard it it was on yeah. one of the either the tsunami project or the Haiti Correct. Project, one of yes. Things. Yes. One of those. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You guys were big into that, and and the Prague, the Prague community came together for a lot of great uh, calls. Yeah. Um, I think they did one for Katrina as well. Uh, so there was a lot yeah. going on. A lot of these. It's like, oh, cool. We get to have some more new, uh, new stuff. Exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, the way we got them wasn't great. But <laughs> right. Right. Um, and then you, uh, you have another uh, Brems song, a uh, life cycle. Yes, that's that's a, a, it's a song that he has on his first solo album called Womb Song, but this has um, the whole band on it and Laura singing on it, and it's a, it's a really lovely piece. I can attest to the fact that Womb Song is a is a good album. Yeah, very, very strong album. Um, where did I'll Never Finish Loving You come from? That came from Tom. That's a Tom penned song. Um, and I think it's a really gorgeous song. And I and I actually had forgotten it existed until we were talking about and he wrote it around this time. So, you know, he said, Oh, I think we I think we should include it. I was like, Yeah, I'll definitely include this. 
uh oh how it's great the alternate um uh, alternate mix what what is different about this than the one we that we're familiar with it's extremely different it's um it is very atmospheric it's not it doesn't have the groove going through it um tom was kind of playing around with different mixes and it's funny he sent me this mix and he's like what do you think of this and i was like what do i think of it for what i thought he i thought he wanted to use it <laughs> on the kind of proper album as like the the new mix and I, and I was like I don't think we should use this. He's like no no the bonus disc. I was like oh yeah okay great. <laughs> it's very um, different, very yeah, different for sure. Uh, and then you've got a live version of coming like light, which is also from Cal Prague 08. So you saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then I, I love the little what are we playing bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> talk a little bit about that because you you ended up playing Mists of Dalriada, but uh, it seemed like somebody wasn't quite sure what was going on at that point. Yeah, I, I think I, that was recorded at the New Jersey Prague House, probably during one of our, I mean, we've played so many shows, we've been so lucky to have the support of the Prague House, and they've been with us from the beginning, um, and uh, at the end of those shows, we often have a lot of fun, because it's kind of like, fam feels like family, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I, Tom and I go at it a little bit on stage in a friendly way, and so... I probably was sort of like, let's just let's just start playing, you know. And Tom will figure it out eventually, but he was nervous. You know, what are we playing? What are we? What are we playing? You have to tell me what we're playing. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you guys figured it out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the album proper. Um, one of the things that I think stuck out to me was that you have these couple of little connective songs in it, um, mm -hmm. and one is something true and all the new. Those two songs. Mm -hmm it's very easy to lose those songs in the album, but they really, I think get their due on this new mix. I don't know what it is. I couldn't really explain it to you if, if I had to gun to my head, but that's when I really took notice of these two songs. Yeah. No, I'm glad you did. And I'm glad you had that re response. Cause I, the, they were actually in the, on the first, the original CD, they, they were both a little bit lower in volume actually than the album. So, um, it was easy to lose them, but we really wanted to bring out the beauty in both of them because they they definitely have their a strong connective tissue with the story. Mm -hmm. Um where, you know, all the new is sort of um you know, the the our our hero trying to to come to grips with you know, am I going to go into this like pop music machine? Um where it's all about the video it's all about the how you look and not how you not what the music is but your image and all that sort of thing and then the something true is coming out the other side saying like no this is i found my something true i'm going to go this route mm -hmm. so uh they're really important yeah yeah and like i said they they if you're listening to them in in the course of listening to the album it just sounds like it's the ending of the previous song right the new one like i said the new mix does let it stand on its own a little bit more so i think that's yeah. a, a cool thing but you can really hear the difference right off the bat with spinning around you you can hear the the space and the clarity and like it's almost like listening like i have a 5.1 stereo in my den uh, and it's a stereo album but it almost sounds like it's coming at you in 5.1 that's mm. how that's what i mean that's how when i rave about this mix that's what i'm raving about it's like wow. it almost sounds like a surround mix but it's not and the you know you go through these first three songs this really strong opening to the album spin around i move by the way i'm going to pause right here and ask you what a many tendril toreador is <laughs> <laughs> brian brian corellian wrote those lyrics actually um well, I think it is what it says it is. <laughs> you know, the, the uh, you're you're you know you're you're in there with in the ring with the bulls, and you and you're just kind of like you're uh, you have many tendrils to to w at which from which to wave the flag at the bulls. Okay, all right, fair enough. And then uh, for me, where I first just when I first really started noticing new parts that I hadn't noticed before was when you got to "I Already Know," which is a very atmospheric song. Yep. And like I said before, Brems plays these subtle, very Steve Hackettish bits. I don't even know what they're called, but they just kind of, it's like there's no guitar. And then it just kind of, 
and then it comes in. Yeah. Yeah. That is so cool. And I, I swear I've listened to this album a lot of times and I don't, they've never popped like they do now. Yeah, no, I agree. That was, my, as I said before, like listening to, I already know for the first time with the remaster, I was sort of like, there's something special here. There's, you can hear, you can hear Brems's parts a lot clearer. The keyboard sounds are much more lush and present. And I think, um, elevate an already emo very emotional guitar solo um and it's you know that when we play that song even we we had we played a show in boston um recently um every when we play that song i almost lose i almost lose myself in that song i can't i can't lose myself because i have to play bass pedals too so i have to pay attention but it yeah, does yeah. get to me it definitely gets to me i can understand why um i also wanted to bring up the of course uh fantastic instrumental star evil noma sue and it's become a concert staple for is obviously and of course the the, the sharp eyed among us will will be able to tell you that if you read those words backwards it spells out rats live among us where did that come from <laughs> <laughs> what, um so a friend of mine um i my friend joe who i've been friends with for since we were five years old um he ha he ha he said it one day. He was like, "It's like Star Evil Noma Sue." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And he's like, "Rats live among us." I'm like, and he wrote it out, and I was like, "That's awesome! Can I use that for a title of, for a song?" And he's like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> um, but we hadn't written anything, yet, of course. But I was like, "That is just so cool." Yeah. Um, and so the music for Star Evil was uh, a, came out of a probably 25 minute jam that the band had um and tom recorded recorded the entire jam went home uh cut it up in a way he thought was pleasing and then we had to relearn it <laughs> <laughs> in the way he thought was pleasing which he was absolutely correct about it is it's great yeah um but that was how that song came to be and it, and it plays a crucial role in the album because you know the the hero is kind of going through this dark night of the soul during that mm -hmm. it's i think the most angular song on the record and and maybe the most angular song in your in your catalog it's probably the most crimsony maybe yeah i would say that yeah. i tend to i mean so the the jam we had for whatever reason I was on, I had an electric guitar on my shoulder as well as Brems and Tom was playing keyboard bass. And uh, because I'm not uh, the kind of guitar player that Brems is, and it's not really, you know, it's not my main instrument, but I do love, I do love playing electric guitar because it's fun. Um, I play a little bit more angular and a little bit more kind of like, I guess, Fripp-ish than Brems does. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's... But I, I love the, the interplay between that kind of angular frip guitar and then Brems just comes in with this, you know, lovely melodic stuff over ne over the top of it, which is great. Yeah. 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 That's Brems does that so well. And, yeah. and he could shred as well. So oh, yeah, he's an amazing. Very talented guy. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand him when you talk to him, but <laughs> <laughs> very thick accent. But yeah, he's he's great. Um Another Door is another concert staple for you guys. This one is, is it's really a beautiful song. And what is it about that song particularly that speaks to you guys in the band that make you want to perform this? Yeah, I think it's a it's it's another one, it's another song that Tom wrote. Um it's a really beautiful song. Um I think the lyrical content is is beautiful and kind of plaintive and um yearning to uh to do what's right and to do the right thing and to find the person who is going to help you do that um and so there's just a kind of emotional like pull to that song uh and of course it also has a great kind of groove in it and and, a, and another emotional brems guitar solo so we always love our emotional Brems guitar solos. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we do. Uh, Believe really is a song that shows off 
the vocal uh just the beauty of the vocals when you guys harmonize and it's um probably vocally one of the best tracks in your catalog i think mm. Thank you. Yeah, that was one I wrote. This the I don't know. I've told the story a lot, so pardon me if I've told it before. But it's that song I wrote. Uh, I was too chicken to ask Laura to go on a date, <laughs> and um, so instead I wrote a song and asked her to help me sing it. And that was the that was my you know that was my way in. Um, but she you know she she agreed. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> It worked. But that you was can't song. argue with the results. Hey, no, you can't argue. And so that song was written a couple of years before I Move came out. But when we, when Tom was looking for a song to fill this kind of place in the album of, okay, we've gone through the dark night of the soul and we found another door and now we have something true. What comes next? Like, what's the, you know, and Believe, and I played, you know, Believe, and he's like, oh, that's perfect. Let's, that goes here, you know. Yeah. So it works. It works. It works. Then you've got your most ELP ish song, <laughs> Night of Nights. And it's, I mean, I, I think I've always recognized that it was the ELP ish with the, with the keyboards, especially, but um, the new mix again, the, they, they get really vibrant on the new mix. Yeah. And yeah. It, it just really gives, uh, gives Tom a chance to show off a little bit, I guess. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Another, yeah, another song that um, we definitely leaned into the prog on that one for sure. Um, it, for some years, it, I, I was, I, I don't, I don't want to say I was soured on the song because that's not the right word, but uh, I always thought like, well, it's good. At, this song fits in the album I move and it's great where it is, but pulling it out to play in a live show always felt a little, I don't know, a little something maybe a little on the nose or a little something to me but when now that we're playing i move in its entirety on the, in these shows we're doing um i really like it again I, and and it's been fun to play live but we've only played it a couple times in our whole career so it's been fun to play yeah what i like about it is that i think you get you get that elp style a little bit but you also get this really melodic chorus mm-hmm so it's got it's got some nice uh, contrast to it, I think. Yeah. Um, is is the Miss of Dariata? Is that a Brem song? It absolutely one hundred percent is. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be a Brem song. I don't know how you know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just this. Uh, it's got a nice. That's that's got a nice groove to it, but it's yeah. it's like really a, uh, I don't know, like an Irish jig kind of thing. Yeah, it is. It's exactly what it is. Yep. Yeah. With some shredder. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, the, the big three-part album closer of Oh, How It's Great, Coming Like Light and Light From Your Eyes. That is, to me, and I'm not paying lip service here. For me, in the last 20 years, this might be the best run of songs on a progressive rock album. Wow. Wow. Thank you. That Wow. That's saying a lot. It's got everything. I mean, it's got your... What, it, what that reminds me of, and it's it's so different so different from this so it's going to sound stupid when i say it but for me when that when you that run of three songs you've got some you get that sort of really cool um oh how it's great it's almost like a just a pop rock song and then yeah. coming like light gives you your your whole big prog piece and then you've got the soft light from your eyes at the end and that reminds me of gates of delirium going you know, from the beginning to the crazy part and to uh, soon. Yeah. Well, that's high praise. Thank you, Michael. I'll, and I'll, I'll I want to make sure the band hears that because that's really amazing. Um, but I think I kind of understand the Gates of Delirium thing. I mean, the the first part of Gates of Delirium is a, is a, a song. It's just a song song. Mm -hmm. You know, just strumming. Stand and fight. We. I mean, it's just yeah. a song. And, and then, then it goes like froggy bit. Right. And, and then, then soon. And then soon, which is the the beautiful, which is gorgeous, and, yeah. And, and in full disclosure, just the soon single edit was on my wedding disc. Wow, well, there you go, alongside "Light from Your Eyes." So, yeah, and we had a proggy wedding. My, so my <laughs> it's funny you're talking about your wedding though, because today is Laura and my 16th wedding anniversary. No kidding. Today, yeah. What are you doing on this with me? <laughs> oh, we, we're celebrating tomorrow. It's okay. all good. It's all good. All um, right. Well, congratulations. But, uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. But it's funny because um, our wedding song that we danced to was Made Again by Marillion. No kidding. Yes. Wow. That's great. I just got that box set, that uh, reissue from them. So very cool. Very cool. So you mentioned you're going to do this in its entirety. How many shows do you have booked? We uh, we are playing in Danbury, Connecticut in in February, February 10th. We are playing in Dover, New Jersey on January 28th. We are playing in Chicago on January 14th. Uh, that will be announced soon. Details and dates and venue and all that. I'm sorry, venue and time and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at DC, Baltimore area. So we're hoping to do six or seven shows at least of this kind of like I move tour. That would be cool. Are you yeah. going to be filming any of it for a DVD release? That is on the menu. Yes. That would be very cool. This is a, yeah. this is an album. I feel like it deserves its own video release. I yeah, think I agree. A, a big, big treat for is fans to have yeah. that, uh, that they could throw in the player anytime they want. So, um, Agreed. so, Hey, no pressure, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> no thank you i've been thinking about it we did record a bit of the boston show that we played in october it was our so this that was our first show back after three years essentially mm -hmm. um and i thought it was real. it was great i thought that it was a really great audience and i thought we played well um there were some bumps and bruises along the way as you might expect for our first show so i'll we'll, we'll take a look at how that show came out and then i would like to do a multi-camera recording at one of these shows too yeah. yeah so you've been together for more than 20 years yeah and the lineup's still together how does this happen in this day and age i don't know michael i don't know we we so we had we the, before the pandemic we played in los angeles in january of 2020 mm -hmm. um we oh we were on such a good run row uh, roll we were about to open for big big train and their first North American tour. We were about to go to Europe to play at the Night of the Prague Festival in July of 2020. And of course, nothing, none of that ever happened. Um, and of course, it's all for the good and it's, you know, it disappointing, but, you know, lots of lots of great stuff came out of it musically. Laura's album was written and recorded and released. Um, so when we came back together for the first time to rehearse for our Boston show, we kind of just looked at each other and were said a lot of a lot of things you just said michael like how, like we're still together we still love each other we're still doing this we don't really raise our you know we don't get in fights we we really like playing with each other um and so we're really grateful because not many bands get to do this for this long it's, i would think especially bands that have siblings in it yeah <laughs> <laughs> we've really mellowed we used to back in the day we would get into some some arguments but uh but we've mellowed yeah so alan and neil morris play the same guitar together but i've seen you and tom play the same keyboard together right and it, we will on this tour there's yeah there's a part in star evil no masu that requires four hands on a piano <laughs> so um and the thing about that is for me the most nerve-wracking part of that is not playing the notes it's I have to switch sounds for Tom <laughs> in the middle of that because the sounds switch so rapidly. So I'm like, I have to, I'm playing the chords and then I have to switch the sound and switch the sound. And it's like, it drives me crazy. Yeah. It's like you're operating the mixing desk while you're playing music. Exactly. It's very, <laughs> very odd. It's very cool. So uh, I move anniversary edition. See, it says right there that it's the anniversary edition. It right there. That's how you know it. And also, you know, you're going to see an extra disc in here. It's got the trifold. And this can be found, you can be ordered this on ismusic.bandcamp.com and all of the online retailers. It's available now because as we as I mentioned, we're recording this on the day that it went live. Uh, you can also download it from all the, the usual download sites. If you got it already by the time this goes out it'll be fixed but i know you guys had a glitch with star evil yeah it was just pointed out to us luckily it's not on the cd um 
But when we, for Bandcamp, they uh, require that you upload individual tracks. You can't kind of do the whole thing in a, in a DDP file. So we, uh, for whatever reason, the Star Evil track seemed to have some kind of clicks in it. Okay. Uh, so we discovered that tonight and we'll have it remedied either tonight or tomorrow morning. Great to hear. Great to hear. So uh, I hope this does really well for you. I know that uh, everybody that's already bought the original iMove is going to be like, oh, why should I buy that again? I am here to tell you absolutely buy it again. And then you can keep the old one as a keepsake or you can turn on someone new to his music by giving this to a friend that maybe hasn't heard them before. Um, I'm going to keep them both because I'm a completist. I'm a whack job. So I hear you. I'm with you. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I moved the 20th anniversary edition. Uh, John, it's been a pleasure hearing about this from you. It's been twice as much a pleasure listening to it. It's fantastic. Wow. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate everything you said and um, really, really means a lot to us. So thank you.